Good morning and welcome to this Corporate Overview and Scrutiny Committee meeting, which is being convened as a hybrid meeting. The meeting is being recorded and will be available via the Council's website to be viewed subsequently. Some of you may already be aware that I have a condition called adult onset epilepsy, which occasionally results in me experiencing short absences or mild seizures. On the rare occasions that this may happen in a meeting, you should not be alarmed and should I as chair experience one of these absences or have any other technical ICT difficulties during the meeting, it has been agreed that Councillor Freya, Le Freya Bledsoe will step in temporarily as chair and in her absence, then Councillor Penhale Thomas will step in during the meeting. Please can everyone ensure that mobile phones are switched off or switched to silent mode. Members will have received an electronic copy of the agenda and I will ask the officer to present a brief summary of the key points. For the record, the agenda can be viewed on the Council's website. Officers and members are reminded to refer to the page numbers contained in the public version of the agenda report pack. Members and officers will be speaking at various points during the meeting and those speaking may switch their microphones on at that point. But I would ask that with the exception of myself as chairperson, at all other times you keep your microphone switched off as this will help to minimize any background noise and interference. However, I would invite members and officers to leave their cameras on for the duration of the meeting as agreed at a recent full council meeting. If any members and officers wish to raise a point or question, they should click the raise hand icon at the top right hand side of the Microsoft Teams window and I will come to you in the order I receive requests. Please lower your hand once you've finished speaking. The instant messaging chat button has been disabled for the meeting. Please do not use your microphone until I invite you to do so. Officers from Scrutiny will be supporting the meeting and will be monitoring the use of microphones throughout its duration and where necessary will mute those not being used. I will ask officers to introduce themselves when I invite them to speak during the course of the meeting. They too should ensure microphones are switched off when not in use. And I will now proceed to the agenda and item one and that's apologies for absence. I will now ask Merrill to announce the apologies for absence received. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Ross Thomas has advised that he will try to join the meeting as soon as possible. I don't have any other apologies. Thanks. Thank you, Meryl. I believe Councillor Heidi Bennett has uh, done the same and she will uh, join the meeting as soon as possible. Uh, Councillor Graham Walter, please. Uh, thanks, Chair. Um, I will need to leave the meeting at uh, 1 p.m. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councillor Walter. Councillor Paul Davis, please. Yes, uh, Ditto Chair, I believe the, the meeting has to have one o'clock. Are we making my way down to the Civic for this afternoon? OK. OK, thank, thank you, you. Councillor Davis. Councillor Howell Williams, morning. I will need to leave at 12 o'clock for a few more. OK, many condolences and thank you. Uh, no problem at all. Um, are there any other apologies for absence? Can't see anyone indicating, so we'll move to item two and that's declarations of interest. If any member has a declaration on any matter on the agenda, please click on the raise hand icon. Can't see anyone indicating, so we move to item three on the agenda and that's the approval of minutes. Please can I have a mover and a seconder of the minutes? Councillor Walter. Thank you, Chair. I can't move or second. I wasn't at the meeting, but I did offer my apologies um, to yourself. I've, I neglected to do so to uh, Democratic Services. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Walter. Subject to that amendment, uh, is someone prepared to move and second the minutes? I move. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. I'll second it. Thank you, Councillor Berto and Councillor Hughes at the same time. Thank you very much. Uh, we now move to, sorry, Councillor Williams, you've got your hand raised. Um, yes, thank you very much, Chair. I was going to move or second, but from my screen, I can. I seem to be the only one with my camera on, so I'm just checking that the cameras are on or, or if it's my system playing up. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Williams. No, there aren't any other cameras on, and it was agreed at full council that uh, cameras ought to be left on, if at all possible. So. Um, that's just a, a reminder for members that if they can and they're in a position to do so, please leave your cameras on. Uh, thank you for the reminder, Councillor Williams. Um, so the uh, minutes have been approved uh, and seconded. So we now move to our substantive item on our agenda today, and that's item four, the medium term financial strategy 2024 to 25 to 2027 to 28. 
And now I'll ask the Chief Officer of Finance, Performance and Change, Karis Lord, to briefly introduce the report. Karis, morning. Morning, thank you, Chair. Um, just to confirm for the recording, I am Karis Lord, the Chief Officer for Finance, Performance and Change. I'll just do a brief introduction to the report, if that's all right, Chair. So the purpose of this report this morning is to present to you the draft medium-term financial strategy for the period 2024-25 through to 2027-28. And that includes a financial forecast for the four-year period, together with a detailed draft revenue budget for the coming financial year 24-25. So the committee has received monitoring reports throughout this financial year, <clears throat> detailing the financial pressures that we have and the increased demand for services and the impact of the cost of living crisis on our budgets by way of pay and price inflation. And these level of pressures are unprecedented. It has made the budget planning process for the coming financial year more uncertain and certainly a lot more challenging than usual. The level of service and budget cuts that need to be made are significant, but the Council will remain ambitious and continue to make a significant investment in public services to maximise the level of service possible for residents within the county borough. So the principles underpinning the budget that you have in front of you today are as follows. The Council will seek to safeguard and protect the most vulnerable people in our communities. We'll encourage residents and communities to support themselves and provide advice to enable this to happen. We'll seek to limit service growth in the coming financial year. And all services right across the Council have been required to contribute to the overall savings that we need to make. Also, we are mindful of the predicted financial austerity across the public sector, which is, which is currently forecast to go on for a number of years, and we need to plan to ensure the financial viability of this council as we move forward. And we will also seek to recover the cost of services via fees and charges wherever it's possible to do. There's a lot of detail in this morning's report, and I'm certainly not going to go um, through it all for you. But just to remind you the context within which we're setting this budget, which is that we've, we've taken £75 million out of our revenue budget since 2010. Um, there, and we also are facing a number of external pressures which we have to meet. Things like legislative changes, man, many of which are not fully funded by Welsh Government. We've seen increased demand in many of our services now. And we have a demographic changes within our population which means that we have uh, increasing numbers of people who need our support. So, but in summary, in education, the council, I won't go into these in detail because I think some of these are going to other committees, Chair, but we're uh, proposing to increase the spend in education whilst there's a proposed cut in there for schools of 5%. Social, well, social care and well-being um, are being uh, given considerable pressures in acknowledgement of the increased demand and complexity of care that they are running with. And, there were, and the public realm is also within the papers that you see today, and it remains a challenge for the Council to continue to meet public expectations for the highly visible and tangible services within our overall Council budget. So the draft settlement that we had from Welsh Government was announced on the 20th of December, it was an overall increase across Wales of 3.1%, with 3% coming to Bridgend, and that equates to £7.79 million additional coming from Welsh Government in their funding for next year. In putting this together, the draft budget you have is predicated on a council tax increase of 9.5% for, for next year, sorry, and then going forward within the longer term uh, strategy, it's an assumed annual increase of 4.5%. Having looked at the figures and the pressures which we think we're going to have to manage in the coming four-year period, the most likely scenario is that we will need savings of £34.3 million over that period of time. So the draft revenue budget for next year is shown for you in Table 5 of this morning's report. And in this, there are cost pressures of £11.8 million across the Council as a whole. With regards to um, chief execs, there's 399,000 council chief execs pressures, and there are also council-wide budget pressures of 996,000. Across the council as a whole, 16 million pounds has been identified, and those are detailed for you at Appendix B. 
it has been extremely difficult this year to identify reductions in the in the service budgets and it has required some difficult decisions being made in order to make these bring these services forward this level of budget reduction is unprecedented and it will have a wide ranging impact across all services in the council for this committee in particular reductions for chief execs are 2.4 million and proposed council wide of I've got 90 million here no and, and there are some in there for council wide as well which I'm sure we'll move on to as we as we go into the so the allocation from Welsh Government just to be clear was above what we were estimating because we'd modelled on a 2.5 percent increase which means that we have had additional income from Welsh Government next year of, of 1 million pounds we also have an issue with regards to the funding of teachers pension going forward into the next financial year and we're seeking clarity on that as to whether or not that will be funded um, externally rather than a requirement for the Bridgend Council. And the cost of that is £3.2 million in next year. So within the draft budget, the funding, this funding has been set aside and not allocated. It's been held centrally while we clarify the position on teachers' pension. Uh, and it may be, it can, its use will be determined when we get to the final budget proposals. Just to remind you that in the programme also is, the, is um, some information around capital. Uh, we've been awarded um, £7.9 million from Welsh Government to fund our capital programme next year. Uh, members will be aware from the monitoring reports we've brought you during the year, the pressures within the current capital programme due to um, inflation, um, delays due to ch supply chain difficulties. <clears throat> So, but the find that a revised capital programme will be considered by council in February, and any further changes will be added to the final um, budget proposals when they come through to cabinet and council at the end of February. Due to the limited capital resources that we've got and the pressures currently sitting in our capital programme, no capital bids have been requested for the coming financial year at this point. So these proposals are, as you know, are now subject to consultation with all four scrutiny committees. The first one of those is this one this morning. The public consultation is now also live and will conclude on the 4th of February. The findings from both exercises will be considered when drafting the final budget for next year. So Chair, if I may, I'd just like to take you to the recommendations where we're asking the committee to consider the information contained in the report and also to determine whether to make any comments or recommendations for consolidation and inclusion in the report to Cabinet on the draft MTFS, including the proposed budget pressures and budget reduction proposals within the remit of this scrutiny committee as part of the overall budget consultation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Karis, uh, for that presentation and for setting out the incredibly challenging uh, financial situation uh, which faces the local authority going forward. Uh, just for those members of the public which may be tuning into scrutiny session today, this, this corporate overview and scrutiny committee will be discussing the overall council-wide issues and the chief executive's director today. Uh, so if you don't see us mention some of the key areas of the proposed budget, it will be picked up by the subject overview and scrutiny committees, which will be taking place over the course of the next few days. Education and family support will be discussed tomorrow, uh, chaired by myself. Uh, social services and wellbeing will be on Friday, chaired by Councillor Bledsoe, and then communities will be on Monday, chaired by Councillor Davis. So at this meeting, we'll be only focusing on the council-wide and corporate issues, as well as those responsibilities which sit with the Chief Executive's Directorate, uh, which are finance, housing, ICT, performance, customer services, communications, human resources, legal, democratic services, procurement and registrars. Uh, before we go to the uh, scrutinising the cover report, can I invite the leader and the cabinet member for finance, um, Councillor Williams, to add a political perspective and outline what your and the cabinet's priorities have been in setting this draft budget and how you've come to the conclusion that these are the right cuts to make and to, to meet the very stark financial challenges which are facing us in this and in future financial years. Councillor David? Thank you for uh, that, uh, Councillor um, Williams, and, and thanks to the uh, committee uh, for um, uh, the, the scrutiny I'm sure they will undertake on uh, the, the medium-term draft, medium-term uh, financial uh, strategy. 
And, and of course, um, the, um, the approach that we've taken is to implement the principles that are in the medium term financial strategy. And those principles, first and foremost, include protecting the most uh, vulnerable people in uh, Bridget and Camdy Borough and uh, protecting uh, wherever we can the services that are, are provided to those, those individuals. We've also got a, um, a principle around uh, ensuring that we minimise the impact on frontline services and uh, ensuring that uh, the backroom function is as efficient and effective as as it can be. There's also a commitment to work in in collaboration with with others as well. So we'll we'll look to and we've looked to implement those principles uh, wherever we can um, within the uh, medium term financial strategy. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Councillor David. Councillor Williams, do you have any supplementary remarks? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, well, just to support what the, what the leader has said, this, uh, this um, mid-term financial strategy is driven by uh, principles, and that is to protect the most vulnerable, to support residents, to find uh, solutions where possible, uh, to give very careful consideration of growth, um, to ensure that savings are uh, distributed evenly across the, the Council, to have a, a, an efficient back office, uh, to be mindful of the cost of living issues that uh, the general public are, are facing, and to maximise income whenever possible in light of the, uh, the, the, the previous principle. Um, now, we, we've got uh, an approved corporate plan, uh, and they are our political priorities in that corporate plan, so uh, this MGFS will be there to support that uh, corporate plan going forward. The corporate plan will be revised and will be presented alongside this uh, report at full council, and then there'll be an opportunity for uh, for members to to, to take a, a decision on that. Um, this has been a very difficult uh, process, um, not uh, made any more easier because, of course, we find ourselves in uh, an overspend position currently, and uh, and our priority is to retain control of the authority. And that is to get our finances on track, make sure that we've got a sustainable, robust financial strategy going forward, because what we want to be is in control. We don't want the, uh, the commissioners to come in here and take away that uh, flexibility we have to target resources where we believe they are our priorities. So that's the political perspective. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor David and Councillor Williams for outlining that political perspective. I know Councillor David has indicated that he'd like to come back in. Yes, I, I hope I didn't miss uh, some of the principles because they're important principles. And I know they're principles that we've, we've discussed previously. Uh, and I think it's important, actually, that we don't lose sight to those, those principles and be interested, obviously, if, if, if members have a, a different perspective on that, because they're very much driven uh, this budget. They've driven previous uh, budgets as, as well. So just to emphasise, um, as the, the Cabinet members outlined, um, we, we've required all directorates to contribute to the overall uh, savings required this year and in previous years. So unfortunately, uh, that uh, has meant that every service has been required to make uh, uh, savings. And also, uh, we've been uh, mindful of the uh, predicted financial austerity, which is which is to come. So unfortunately, this is not a one-off. All the predictions and forecasts, uh, and most importantly, the predictions and the forecasts from Welsh Government, who of course provide uh, the lion's share of our funding, is that next year's uh, settlement uh, will be even worse than this year's settlement. So this year, we have a cash increase that cash increase is not uh, adequate from Welsh Government to cover all the pressures we face. So in real terms, it is not a, a real terms increase, it's a real terms reduction. Next year, um, we have been told to plan for a flat cash um, settlement from Welsh Government. And there are three um, ways in which you can effectively um, uh, balance the, the, the books if you've got pressures and you cannot avoid those pressures. There are budget reductions, council tax increase, 
and the settlement from Welsh Government. And if the settlement from Welsh Government is much lower than it needs to be, then inevitably, if the budget pressures are, are there, then that can be balanced either through budget reductions or council tax increase. Uh, and, and this year, uh, because we don't have the uh, the increase that we need in resources uh, from uh, Welsh Government, then the, um, the, the the balance is is coming from the, the biggest um, burden is, is falling in terms of budget reductions on uh, service areas. Uh, and the other principle uh, that is um, in the re the report, and again, is a principle. Uh, that you will all all have seen because it's a principle from previous um, uh, plans is that we look to recover uh, the cost of services via charges and fees um, where um, the authorities is able to do uh, uh, so uh, in some cases if it's not able to do that so I think that covers off the um, uh, the, 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 the principles and there is a is a final one because there's a, a number of principles um, within the medium-term financial strategy, uh, uh, and that is um, where um, we encourage residents and communities to support themselves. And I suppose the most obvious example of that is the community asset transfer uh, process, which has seen some, uh, some 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 success in that model of of working with uh, uh, working with communities. So I think that covers off the the the, the, the principles. Uh, Chair, I should also add, I, I said it yesterday, but of course, to be fair, lots of members didn't sit through Cabinet yesterday, uh, weren't able to, and I wouldn't ex expect them all to do uh, to do that. Um, we have, um, of course, um, sp spoken to and continue to speak to other local authorities uh, to see uh, what good practice there is out there, what other alternatives there are out there, what other ideas there are out there. Um, and of course, we always look to adopt them wherever we can. Uh, the reality is, though, that across Wales, the picture is very similar. Uh, and I'm not aware of any local authority that isn't going to increase their council tax. Uh, I'm not aware of any local authority that isn't making significant budget uh, reductions uh, to, to balance uh, their books. Um, uh, so that's another important point. And, um, we obviously uh, rely and depend on uh, professionals of officers' advice and officers identifying proposals. Um, uh, we have um, in front of us all the proposals that have been brought forward uh, to us. Uh, there are no uh, proposals or alternative proposals in terms of budget reductions uh, that ha have not been brought forward uh, to us. Uh, um, because they're not there. That is a reflection of where we are, unfortunately, in terms of the um, in terms of the, the budget setting process. And after making £70 million pounds with the cuts, uh, it, it does mean that it is very limited, um, uh, very very limited um, uh, room for making uh, uh, cuts within the authority uh, that are not difficult, that don't have an impact on the people that we serve. Um, and that, unfortunately, is reflected in, in some of the, the uh, proposals that you have here in front of you today. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Councillor David, for outlining uh, in a comprehensive way uh, your view on the context and principles of the MTFS. No doubt we'll rehearse some of those themes uh, during the course of uh, the meeting, and I'll be making some comments on the budget setting process. Uh, before we delve into some of the details relating to the council-wide services and the chief executive's directorate. Uh, but before I do, I know that Councillor Jones has a question on the executive summary uh, and would like to come in on non-statutory services, um, the impact assessment of budget reductions and consultation with the public. Council yes, uh, thank you, Chair. Can I, first of all, um, thank the, the officers for preparing this report and thank the leader and Councillor Williams for giving a, a greater insight, perhaps, into the political dimension that the budget presents to us. If I could take, please, members, to the executive summary, which is at the start of the report. 
And the executive summary has 12 bullet points, which very succinctly outline the position that we are in and the potential direction of travel that the budget is going to take us. And if we, uh, if we look at bullet point two, the report outlines the financial, legislative and policy context. And if I just pick up on those three words, this is basically inviting those in the meeting today to discuss what would a corporate impact assessment look like when you consider our ability to deliver on the principles moving forward. Corporate impact assessment is mentioned very, very briefly further in the report. But if we were to expand on, on the impact on our ability to provide services in the context, of course, where we've already made £75 million worth of savings since 2010, and this report proposes that a further £34 million is saved over the next four years. So my first question is very much on the corporate impact assessment. Secondly, um, if we could look at uh, the non-statutory services that we provide in the authority. Uh, can I say from the outset, no doubt, non-statutory services play a key role in supporting people in the county borough, especially those who are most vulnerable. And we have provided non-statutory services for the last 12 years at a time when we've had 70 million taken out of our budget. So we will have to look at, I think, very, very carefully our ability to maintain non-statutory provision. So what it would be the cost of continuing non-statutory services within the MTFS for the next four years? And finally, the, uh, the executive summary talks about consultation. Consultation with members and the various scrutiny committees having the opportunity to look at the draft budget. But the most important people here are the public. Yes, we have a public consultation process, but we appear to be adopting the same process as we, do, we have done for the last 10 years. So my question is, what ideas and what views do strategic leaders have in this authority to take the public with us in relation to having to make these difficult decisions? Members will make those decisions, but not before listening to the consultation. And I say this having um, been uh, you having been focused basically on, on social media at the moment, which is a wash of all these draft proposals that do nothing but damage the reputation of this authority. No councillor wants to make a cut and support a cut. But what I would ask is that we up our game into terms of consulting with the public. So my final question is, what ideas, what views do strategic leaders have to reach out to the public and take them with them with us on the, or take them with us on this process? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Jones. So three elements to that question: the impact assessment, the cost of non-statutory services, and consultation with the public. Who would like to take that first, Councillor David? Yeah. So first of all, um, on on the consultation and engagement. Um, uh, we have uh, struggled this year because of the uh, the timelines from Welsh Government around the settlement um, and, and and simply the scale of, of the challenge this year. Uh, I think we, we'd all um, uh, like to see a different process next year in terms of the budget setting process, and that includes consultation and engagement, uh, and I, that's certainly something uh, that we will uh, look to do with overview and scrutiny. How can we do consultation and engagement uh, uh, differently? Um, uh, it is difficult within uh, the timescales. Uh, it seems to get later every year that we receive the uh, the draft financial uh, settlement, uh, but that is something that we'll, we'll look to do uh, this year and start planning for that now. Uh, in terms of the uh, the statutory um, uh, a non-statutory uh, discussion uh, within the budget uh, proposals are a, a number of propo proposals to uh, reduce some of those services that are, are, are non-statutory. Uh, uh, there, there, there are a number of those within uh, the, the, the proposals, unfortunately. That's not to say they're services that are not valued or valuable to people. Um, but we are at that position. 
as Councillor Jones has outlined, after um, over £70 million pounds of the cuts, where we're having to look at services that, even when they're not uh, st statutory, uh, they are um, valid and valuable, uh, but uh, we are going to consult on whether we continue to deliver those uh, services or, or, or not. And then in terms of the uh, assessment, um, all the proposals um, will have individual assessments uh, with them. And of course, uh, what you have here is a summary of those budget uh, uh, proposals. Uh, and no doubt there will be uh, further information that, that uh, over and Scrutiny Committee will request. Um, and, and, and some of that will be driven by where we're changing statutory services, because many of these budget proposals are, are around statutory services, there will be a statutory process around effectively the assessment of um, the, uh, the proposals and the impact that those uh, proposals will have. And of course, we'll have to follow uh, those, those processes. Uh, I hope that um, provides some answer to some of the questions. <laughs> There's three questions there, and, I, and I'm sure colleagues um, including the chief executive, uh, will uh, will want to come in. Um, and I can see he's really desired. So thank you, uh, Chair. Thanks, Councillor David. I think Councillor Williams wants to come in before I bring in uh, Mark. Yeah, I, I'm happy to uh, to, to respond uh, as, as well. I think this, you see, if you look for bad news, it's easy to find it. This report uh, presents £500 million worth of spend in the Gen County Borough. So, and there's a lot of good news in the report as well as bad news. And I think we can sometimes get a little bit swayed by all the bad things that's going on, and we forget some of the good things that we've done. We've got quite a good track record, actually, in the in our investment. Everyone will have their own priorities. Our priority over the last 10 years has been to give uh, children the best possible start in life. We've invested over £200 million in school assets. Uh, we've, we've built two new comprehensive. We've built seven primary schools. Numerous fly and start units have, uh, have gone up across the county borough. And we've still got an exciting programme going forward as well. We've got an £80 million project for Bajen Town Centre with, with the new Bajen College campus. There's a lot of good news going on in Bajen County Borough at the moment. And we don't want to lose sight of that. This report will provide services for over 23,000 uh, children going to school. It will give protection to over 7,000 individuals in our social care system. And it will also provide safety for over 500 individuals who are currently homeless. There's a lot of good news in here, and we don't want to lose focus on that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Mark? Thank you, Chair. Yeah, perhaps if I could just make a, a few comments in response to your uh, to the questions. Um, I think there's a there's an element of having to look at statutory and non-statutory. Uh, and my, my caution would be that we don't go into a rabbit hole. Um, it's been described to me as a lawyer's tea party. I mean, most of statutory services are not defined. In other words, uh, we're told that we have to provide them, but we're not told to what level uh, or exactly how. So we need to be careful about that. But more fundamentally, regardless of that. Um, I think, in answer to your question about public consultation or Councillor Jones's question, I think there's a, a case for a larger public conversation during the course of this year, not necessarily related to budget, perhaps actually related to uh, the need to revise the corporate plan in terms of our, uh, our budget situation. And to me, this comes down to priorities. So if, for example, we all determined, and the public determined, more importantly, that our priority should be protecting the most vulnerable, the reality then about whether a service is specifically statutory or not um, is less relevant and whether it makes an impact. Um, in other words, I think we need to be measuring this in terms of impact and extent as well as whether it's statutory. And some of our most impactful services may well be non-statutory services. So for me, it's about priorities. What are, what are we, what are we, sh what should we be doing with, as Councillor Williams mentioned, our, our half a billion pounds? Uh, how do we make the most difference? Uh, and, and if we do that and we have that conversation with the public, I think we might get more meaningful responses rather than asking them to respond about what they might want to cut or what, what they don't want to do. So I think there's something about a different approach, and, and part of that approach is also asking them the part that they can play and communities can play in helping uh, deliver some of those services. So I suppose my, my, my point is I think we, 
you would heard me say regularly that we can't keep doing this the way we're doing it. So if you look at, when we get to the detail later on, when you look at some of the proposals, for example, uh, taking seven lawyers out of um, uh, legal services or taking a similar number of people out of HR or out of procurement or whatever, you can't do that every year, can you? You reach a point quite rapidly where you can't provide that service, so we can't do that. So what we need to determine is what is this authority going to do and do well and going to do to make a difference to local residents? Uh, by definition, there will be other things that we won't be doing. But I think the public conversation needs to be very much about priorities and very much about the things that are most important to people. And then obviously, there needs to be in the lenses of things we have to do as well. But let's not get too far down that rabbit hole of just delivering uh, statutory services, because I suspect we won't do them necessarily that well. Thanks, Mark, for outlining that. A uh, more nuanced approach. I'll pick up, I think, uh, the rabbit hole of statutory and discretionary services, as you probably expect uh, uh, shortly. But, uh, um, Councillor Jones, are you content with the replies? Would you like to come back at all? Yeah, can I thank, thank uh, officers and Mark uh, for that response? And, and I totally agree with Councillor Williams. There are some good stories, but where are they on social media? We, 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 we shoot ourselves in the foot sometimes when we sit back and we allow criticisms of the authority, and we're not proactive in telling the public, not telling, informing the public of the great stuff that is going on. There is a degree of negativity, and it is that negativity we need to address. And I say it time and time again, we need to try and take the public with us. And I'm afraid there are some significant lessons to be learned there. So I, I accept what you're saying, but let's get those messages out there. Thank you, Councillor Jones. Cabinet Member, Councillor Good would like to come in on that. Sorry, your microphone's not on. And the microphone's not working, so... Try and use Councillor Williams' they, microphone. They, they try and silence me, Chair, honestly. It's, uh, it's awful. Um, <laughs> as I was saying, uh, uh, just further to Councillor Jones's um, uh, comments, I, I totally agree. And, and, and we are working with our comms team to make sure that those positive messages are out there. I think, you know, there is, as uh, um, Councillor Williams has, has noted, some really, really positive things going on, including my state town hall. Uh, which is the biggest investment I think we've ever had in any of our Valleys communities, which is going to create an amazing arts, cultural venue, library for that community, um, right to the top of our borough, which, which I think is really, really positive. Um, and we're all really excited to see uh, finally be opened. We've also got the pavilion project about to begin, which again is going to guarantee a really significant historic venue within our borough that's, that's internationally known uh, for, for future generations, and I think we shouldn't forget that. Um, our social media team, I know, does talk about that an awful lot. I think, understandably, sometimes that does get lost in, you know, for, for a lot of people, we do have to talk about, for example, over Christmas when there were missed um, refuse collections, which, which obviously does annoy residents, and, and I think we all understand that. Um, but I also would say that I think it's, it's really important that everyone uh, in this chamber, all elected members, go out there and, and do show uh, and, and talk positively about our borough. Uh, there are some unfortunate comments and some misinformation that often gets put out there on social media uh, by, by uh, members of the public and, to be honest, by members of this chamber. And I think we need to be making sure that when we are talking to people and to the public that we don't run down this authority, that we do engage genuinely in the process and that we make sure that we are delivering the best we can together for this borough as one council. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Good. I think uh, you're right in that we should celebrate the positives of the local authority. However, of course, a plane landing safely at Heathrow doesn't make the news. And of course, we're here to discuss budget reduction proposals and budget pressures. So that's the report, unfortunately, which is in front of us today in a very difficult financial situation. So I'll go to Councillor Tim Thomas now, the chairman of the Budget Research and Evaluation Panel, as it happens. Oh, thank you, Chair. Um, firstly, apologies that I, I got in quite late. I had some technical IT problems. I'm just wondering, Chair, uh, as the I, I did have some general comments about BREP, really, um, as I'm sure you may have. Um, uh, but also, in addition to that, um, as the leader has mentioned, the budget setting process, would this be a good opportunity to seek my uh, clarity on my question about the teachers pension and the contribution from the UK government? Uh, yes, you can come in on um, the uh, final local government settlement and uh, question Karis on that. I think she did uh, mention in her opening remarks 
uh, something to do with the teachers' pensions and the uplift of £1 million from Welsh Government. But uh, would you like to ask that question now? And then yeah, sure. I mean, just to expand on, on uh, what I've already said, I mean, I suspect that since the Cabinet meeting yesterday, there probably hasn't been any uh, developments, but it'd be good to get some clarity if there has in, in the couple of hours uh, since we've had that that uh, Cabinet meeting. But also, um, I think it's it's really most irregular the way this um uh, uh this budget setting process has has been undertaken um so I, I i just want some reassurance that we're not relying on the chain of communication of the welsh government and are, are we do are we making any local representations to the uk government to seek clarity on this uh, on the teachers pensions contribution for the UK government because it's, it's so fundamentally key I mean I, my understanding is it's four million and that's a, a an incredible contribution uh, uh, to, to our overall budget so just some clarity on the on 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 the overall situation and uh, whether we've made any local representations please chair thank you councillor Thomas who would like to take that Sarah? I'll take that shall I chair yeah, um, for, for people who, who didn't sit in on, on Cabinet yesterday, the position with teachers' pensions is that there's a £3.2 million financial implication for Bridgend for next year in funding these pensions. When the draft settlement came out in December, um, it was clarified that that funding is not in the settlement. However, Welsh Government strongly states that it believes that this is funding that should come down from Westminster and shouldn't be funded by a Welsh Government. So the position currently is that the minister has written to Westminster to repeat that request, and we know that letter has gone off. Um, what, what we don't have is clarity with regards to when we will get any, um, where, at, at what point we will have that announcement. And as I said at Cabinet yesterday, we certainly haven't had it as yet. There is a chance that may not come through until the new financial year, in other words, after this budget has been set. May I come back in, Chair? Um, just really i mean that's appalling really isn't it? i mean it's a shambles but what's the what's the precedent really in, in the past uh caris in terms of contributions of pensions in the past has it been incumbent on the uk government to to um support the costs do you know thanks council thomas caris in in the past that funding has come down to us uh, and we've not been in this position before um, I've, I've just recalled you did ask as well about what lobbying is going on with regards to this. Uh, I can confirm that um, the Welsh Local Government Association is certainly lobbying on this on behalf of all local authorities. And also there is a regular dialogue between officials in Welsh Government and the Welsh Treasurers. And that is certainly a subject that is being raised at every meeting we have, seeking clarity both with regards to whether it's coming down and when we will hear. So there is an, an ongoing dialogue, a very regular ongoing dialogue, um, certainly at official and officer level and through the WLGA at a political level as well on this matter. Because the hole in the budget is there for everybody, not just for Bridgen. This is a significant financial shortfall in the settlement for next year. So if I may chair, I mean, uh, just quoting uh, uh, Karis there. So if the precedent has been that in the past, the the contribution has been reliant upon us. What's changed? What 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 now? What's changed that makes makes Welsh government think that it's now uh, the responsibility of the UK government? This is a bit of a shambles. This is what 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 has changed? What why I, I don't understand this to be honest. Thanks, Karis. Well, ordinarily we would get the funding coming down through the settlement, so Welsh government would right. have had that money through. Um, and so usually we are, we, it's clear that whether or not that is in the settlement. So there's okay, just thank you. very different this year. Thanks very much, Karis. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Uh, thank you for being so patient, Councillor Bennett. I'll bring you in now. Thank you, Chair. Could I ask a question on page 14 in relation to council tax collection rates? Would that be appropriate at this time? Um, can I just... Uh, pause a moment. We obviously had a pre-meeting before to establish our questioning strategy and uh, we've got a number of items just before then, if if I may, and then okay. I can bring you in when we discuss council tax. Apologies. Uh, Thank uh, you, Chair. Apologies for uh, not making the pre-meeting. No problem at all. Uh, not everyone can make the pre-meetings. I understand that. Uh, Councillor Bledsoe. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I just want to seek a little bit of clarity on what has just been said, because um, we've just been told that we, we've got to look for the good news in this budget, and I quite agree with that. However, one of the items that we were told is good news in this budget is the um, Regen College PLC, mind as well, PLC, um, and that project. Now, I just want to find out what our, our, and seek clarity on what our financial contribution is to Bridge End College PLC, given that Councillor Williams has highlighted it as one of our good news stories. It's not one of ours. It's the college's good news story. It's not Bridge End Council's, is it not? Can I, can I just intervene? Thank, thank you for that question, Councillor Blesser, but can we try and focus on the overall corporate strategic uh, budget on this occasion. Absolutely, Chair, and I'm quite happy with that, so long as misinformation isn't spread in this meeting as well. Thank you. Okay, well, perhaps we can pick that up uh, separately. Um, I'm going to return to uh, some of the overall strategic matters which we have uh, before us today, and perhaps that can be picked up uh, in writing at a, at a future time. Uh, I'm moving on. Uh, I'm, I'm moving on. I'm, 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 I'm moving on, Councillor Williams. It's now 10.42 and we haven't even got off page one yet. Um, so uh, we're now going to move on. The Deputy Leader would like to come in and then uh, Councillor Griffiths. Thank you very much. I put my hand up to actually contribute to the workforce issue and pay and pension <coughs> concern. Um, the biggest expense that we have in this council is our workforce. I know I said something similar yesterday in cabinet meeting for, the, but for members that weren't there. And while we often hear about our council staff being paid at really, really high rates, that isn't the case. It's a misnomer. The majority of our staff are paid at a level that meets the real living wage, but actually doesn't meet working in a supermarket. So you can earn more by working in a supermarket. Now, I already, I'm sitting, uh, I sit as the WLGA rep for workforce at UK level, and I am already concerned about the level of pay rise that our trade unions are going to submit to us as a claim this year. All our intelligence suggests that this will be comparable to 23-24, an increase of 9.42% it was for this uh, past year. Now, I agree that our staff are worth every penny that they are paid. However, if that is the same, the cost to us as a council will be astronomical because the increase in our budgets, we haven't got the money to cover that pay rise. And, I, and the re, one of the reasons I'm raising this is because our staff are in the same position that we are in as an organisation with pay and prices, cost of living, COVID, all the usual. So, you know, I won't pro procrastinate about that. But something that was very evident to me when I had an email from a staff member when they finally received their pay award last year, it actually wiped out their universal credit because they had it so late that it didn't make any difference to them. This was just prior to Christmas. So my plea in this public forum is to our trade union colleagues to get their ballots organised and sorted when the employers make their offer. Do not delay it significantly and that is all trade unions because they did delay sending out ballots and engaging with their members and that, that that's a real disappointment to me i have to say and the significant impact to everyone every one of our staff is astro astronomical i can't tell you how bad that is so just before christmas a one point a one uh, one thousand nine hundred and twenty five pound pay rise to the lowest paid which I agree with them getting, they didn't actually receive any of that money because by the time they were taxed all, it, it, for all of it, they lost their universal credit for six weeks as well. We cannot allow that to happen. So that is my public plea to all trade unions. Our staff, we are talking about making redundancies here. And our staff are the, one that are out, are, are the ones out there delivering services. We need to support them. I don't know how we're going to do that unless we increase or we get an increase in our consequential from a Westminster government. And Karis has just informed you about the teacher's pay. All our pay rises are UK led, apart from health in Wales. 
we need to be considerate of what is happening at a UK level when it comes to the terms and conditions of our staff, because that is where they are negotiated. Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you uh, for that contribution, uh, Councillor Gebby. I understand Councillor Williams and Councillor Good would like to raise a point of order. Sorry, Chair, I, I forget my mic doesn't work. Yeah, I would like to raise a point of order just on Councillor Bletto's um, last uh, contribution and the implication that Councillor Williams has provided misinformation to this committee. I just want to be very clear that Bridgend County Borough Council is involved uh, significantly within the Bridgend College project. We have provided land to the project, uh, to the to the college. We work very closely with them. We have worked with them through strategic planning. We are working with them through the education department. Um, our development and redevelopment teams are working with them. So I think any implication that Bridgend County Borough Council isn't deeply involved in this project and that this isn't a really positive uh, piece of news for our borough, I think is unfortunate and certainly is not misinformation. So I would ask that the member considers her comments and perhaps uh, withdraws them or rephrases them. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Councillor Good. I'll go straight to Councillor Betso for her comments. Thank you. I too would like to raise a point of order, Chair. I don't know if you saw the intimidation that was going on in this chamber. I am the only independent councillor sat here and every single member along there was staring at me, chuntering, saying disgraceful, shocking, staring me down and trying to intimidate me from my comments. I stand by my comments. Thank you. Right, I'm going to defer to uh, the monitoring officer, uh, Kelly Watson, uh, to... Apologies, can I just make an amendment, Chair? Sorry, except for Councillor Gebby, who did not do that. I, I really do want to focus on this very significant matter at hand, which is our midterm financial strategy going forward. So please, can we do that? But I will defer to Kelly now as the monitoring officer to intervene on this matter. Thank you, Chair, for that. Um, in terms of the original point of order, um, a point of order is a request from a member to the chair of the committee to act on any alleged irregularity in the procedure of the meeting. So what we have here is that members are saying um, that another councillor uh, has said that they've misled the committee. It's a matter for the chair to determine whether you feel the committee has been misled. Um, and if you don't feel the committee has been misled, then you should ask the, the councillor who made that, uh, that, that comment to withdraw it. Can I ask a point of order then <laughs> for myself in so far as I don't know the information, whether the information is correct or not. So therefore, what, what would be your best advice? You need to consider it on the balance of probabilities, really, on the evidence you've got before you. Um, I think Councillor Williams made a factual statement. Um, I think there's clear evidence that the council is involved in the project. Um, it's a matter for you to determine. Okay, thank you, uh, Kelly. Councillor Bledsoe, are you prepared to withdraw the remark following the monitoring officer's statement that it was a factual statement? Otherwise, I suppose we'll have to defer to her to take into account the Member's Code of Conduct in due course. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Kelly. Um, just to refer back to it, the comment was that the entire project was our project, not that we were in part involved or a partner. That was not said, and that is factually incorrect. We are not wholly responsible for this project. We are a partner. Okay. Can, Councillor Williams, Councillor Good, are you, are you content with the re rephrasing of that statement, not wholly? Councillor Williams, Councillor Good? I mean, in the same way that we aren't wholly uh, responsible for my state town hall, because we're in partnership with Arwen, uh, in the same way that we aren't fully responsible for schools, because we get funding from Welsh Government. It's, I mean, I, I totally agree with you, Chair. I would much prefer us to be focusing on the matters at hand and the importance of talking about this budget. Um, I, I think it's unfortunate that, that Councillor Blatter hasn't reflected on that, but I, I would prefer us to move on. Can I, with can I ask members, is everyone content that we move on with the matter at hand? Thank you very, th thank you very much for that. The Deputy Leader would like to come in now. Chair, just one point of order, please, uh, uh, and, and of clarity. <laughs> yeah, you can sit there laughing. But I'm talking to you, so I'm looking at you. Uh, Councillor Gabby, I'm not taking any more points of order. 
that is totally out, out uh, of Well, we've just had an al allegation of intimidation, actually, a can, along this can, bench. Can, Councillor Gabby, I, we've all agreed now that we're going to move on with the discussion of the Muslim I don't, financial I don't think strategy. we have. Actually, I, think we, I think we have all agreed that. Um, I will now defer to Kelly once again to ask her whether we can move on with the subject matter at hand. If members are all in agreement, uh, I think there's no reason why we shouldn't move on now. Um, this meeting is to discuss the, bu the budget proposals and the issues in the papers, and that, that should be the focus of members. We can obviously pick up other issues outside the meeting if needed. OK, are all members content that we move on now? Thank you very much. I'll bring in Councillor Williams. Amanda Williams. Oh, sorry, I didn't know. Too many Williams is. <laughs> I didn't know if uh, Councillor Griffiths had his hand up because I know he was on the list before me in our pre meet and I was coming in to ask a question following his. So I, I was, th my hand was up for, the, for another point of order, but I will, I will, re I will refrain from, st from moving, moving that. It's becoming quite farcical, to be honest with you, this meeting. Um, we will now move to comments that I've got on the budget setting process before we move on to the substantive matters at hand. Um, Councillor Williams, you as cabinet member yesterday said that you are unashamedly a, a poacher of good ideas. So I'm assuming that the proposed annual budget and midterm financial strategy is taking into account what BREP has said over the course of its discussions of the budget. In your view, what influence has BREP had on the budget? Uh, and can you outline some of the changes which you've made as a, as a result? Yes, well, we, we've taken into account the, uh, the, 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 the reports that, that BREP have provided to, uh, to, to Cabinet and um, oh, something specific as, uh, 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 can't come to mind at the, at the moment, uh, I'm sorry, Chair, but um, maybe you will be able to uh, enlighten us on the, the recommendations that, uh, yeah, that BREP so, have provided. Yeah, th thank you, Councillor Williams. That uh, endorses my view as well. I mean, quite frankly, the BREP process isn't currently fit for purpose and I think requires review. It doesn't fulfil its terms of reference uh, of coming to a unity of purpose over the budget setting process and many members and we make up the same membership, membership of COSC is membership of BREP, many members believe that it's simply a tick box exercise and not a genuine attempt to explore all of the different options. Now a cabinet yesterday, a number of cabinet members said, well, where are the alternatives? Where are the different options available? Uh, to this proposed budget and I have to say that I and other members of BREP uh, or COSC have repeatedly asked for information on the rabbit hole what a core service looks like in meeting our legal obligations and Mark has said that sometimes it's not clear cut on where uh, some of our statutory obligations lie but what does a core service look like what are our statutory duties which are outlined within acts of parliament and in acts of the senate so what does BCBC provide in practice for each one of these obligations above and beyond that statutory core service? Because as Councillor Jones mentioned previously, anything above what is statutorily required is a political choice based on a risk assessment, political priorities of the current administration of the day, or it may serve to prevent residents from accessing statutory services, as Councillor Gebby has mentioned on numerous occasions with regards to social services. If we were presented with this information at BREP, we could have had a genuine political debate in the spirit of the one council approach, which is often referenced. Now, the information requested hasn't been forthcoming this year, and without having knowledge of where we currently provide a gold-plated, silver-plated, bronze-plated service above and beyond our statutory obligations and core duties, there is absolutely no way that BREP or cost or any scrutiny member, any backbench member could challenge or endorse the proposals which have been put forward by the cabinet yesterday. So let me be categorically clear. I'm not suggesting that we should roll back on all of our discretionary services, which clearly have a significant preventative role to play, but we should have had a discussion on what Councillor Martin Jones has eloquently said in his email to me and to Karis in December, we should be at a starting point, a bespoke statutory based budget plan 
which provides a cost analysis of, of any commitment with an additional assessment on the impact across the county borough. So can we, in future years, know what the statutory duties and powers are and what a core service looks like? Where we go beyond the statutory minimum? What are the discretionary services which we, we provide, which are non-statutory? What services should we prioritise for discretionary support going forward? Where should we manage the public's expectations, as Councillor Jones has mentioned, on where we cut back on services or where their priorities are, where there's less risk, less risk attached to them, or even consider abolishing some of the discretionary services altogether? Perhaps that's what we need to do. Anyway, our job today is to scrutinise your administration, Councillor David's proposed budget, uh, to the best of our ability. Um, and for many members who don't sit on BREP, they would have only seen the proposals yesterday. So it's very difficult for them to have put, put forward any alternatives. So perhaps if alternatives and amendments are proposed in due course, I hope the Cabinet will consider them. OK, um, we'll now move on to Councillor Thomas. Thanks, Chair. Uh, more by accident than design. Um, that uh, I was going to discuss BREP. Uh, uh, as my point, uh, but you have made a lot of the points I wanted to make, um, so I won't labour my point in too much detail, but I was chair of uh, the BREP panel, um, did that to the best of my abilities, um, I found it quite challenging, very grateful for the leader in his uh, remarks in Cabinet yesterday for acknowledging that I tried to uh, engage with the BREP process as positively as, as I could, but I must say, uh, many of the comments that you've already made, Chair, for that reason, I would be reluctant to chair it again in the future. Um, let, well, let alone chair it, engage with the process as well. Um, I did, you know, I mean, what's the point in BREP in a nutshell, really? I mean, we haven't had any additional information that the members have had as part of this scrutiny panel. I find it difficult to, I mean, each cabinet member was questioned on what conversations they had had with with officers. And I just find it a little bit difficult to believe, to be quite frank, uh, that they hadn't had. There was no additional comments, no uh, additional information. That being said, I am grateful for the scrutiny officers who did their best in trying to get the the uh, meetings in place in the calendar. It was a very challenging time, especially notwithstanding this rather strange timetable for the budget setting process and, and of course the Christmas period. Um, but back to my original point, if unless there's fundamental change, uh, I would be reluctant to engage with the BREP process in the, in the future, I'm afraid, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Well, it was telling from Councillor Williams's response that basically nothing has come out of REP, which has influenced the uh, current budget and MTFS proposals. Councillor Williams, please. Very briefly, I mean, the accusation is, I suppose, that uh, you haven't had the information that you've requested. Is that, is that fair, fair to say? That's the accusation. Correct. Uh, and I would say that you've had all the information that's been made available to us to ask those questions. I would say you've had that information. So, so I, that's my opinion, and it's and it's a contrary opinion to to your own. I accept that, and I don't want to get into a, you know, we said, you said, and all that, That's because that's pointless. But you've had the budget books, and all the information relating to the budget of the authority is contained in the budget book. Now, they're headline figures, and there are figures underneath the figures. You've also had the list of, uh, um, uh, well, I've got it here in front of me, powers and duties. There's 3,622 powers and duties. They're not specific. But that's what we need to undertake as an authority. Now, statutory and non-statutory, I'm sorry to tell you, is a myth. It doesn't really exist because it's, it, you cannot define what is statutory and what is non-statutory at that level. And you have to accept that, Chair. You have to accept that, Chair. No, I've, been to, I've been to meetings and conferences Council, and they say statutory, with all due respect to the, to the monitoring officer, but statutory is the Cal lawyer's tea party Council, because Council Williams. the level of statutory services Council Williams. cannot be quantified. Councillor Williams, our duties are set out, as you've mentioned, in those 6,232 lines or however many yes. you mentioned. They are set out by Acts of Parliament and Acts of Senate Cymru. 
There are statutory duties which the local authority has to undertake, and there are discretionary services. There are levels. There's a, yeah, there's a core the service level, which the local authority has to provide. I, I, I agree with Mark insofar as it, it can be a rabbit hole, and yeah. discretionary services can certainly play a role in preventing people from having to access them. But we should have a starting point. We should have a core service, and we need to know, therefore, where, whereby we gold plate that service, silver plate it, bronze plate it, whatever, so that we know exactly what our core budget is, and there, therefore anything above and beyond that is a political choice. So we haven't had that information. We haven't had what core services look like. As Councillor Jones said, what does a statutory service look like? What do we need to do? And what do we do above and beyond that? Then that becomes the political choice which we can have a genuine debate about at breath and in this meeting. That is my view. You may disagree with it, no. but that is just the view that I'm espousing. I think I think we are on the same page because yeah, what, what we are agreeing is that we cannot define the statutory service. Even though it's in legislation, you cannot define the statutory service. And and you know the, the, the usualness to send out is our library service provision. We can have a library in the county borough and that's that's a statutory. But that's not defined, is it? It's not defined anyway. You cannot define that. One book constitutes a library apparently. Yeah. But it's not you can't so so the, what I'm saying is you can all you can you can have all the arguments you like, but the level of statutory service has to be defined before you can pull a cost to it. And okay. what you're asking us is to pull a cost to something before you've decide defined the service. What I would suggest is you define a core level of service for future years within the local authority that you're prepared to deliver and anything which is discretionary you ought to set out. I'm sorry, but the, you, you've outlined yourself that the BREP process, which is supposed to, the terms of reference of which are supposed to create a unanimity of purpose over the budget, has not influenced your budget whatsoever. That is, you know, a real, um, you know, it's just unbelievable that uh, we have all sat around the table and not been able to influence the administration's budget whatsoever. We are clearly not receiving the information which we require to provide an alternative for you to consider. Well, I think that was the opportunity lost by the opposition it's, to bring forward an alternative for us to consider. It's not just the opposition, it's, it's group, group members from your own administration as well who can put forward amendments. As far as I'm aware, they haven't even seen the, the budget uh, uh, apart from uh, yesterday when it was published. That is extraordinary. Anyway, we'll move on yeah. uh, and we'll go to Councillor Amanda Williams. Thanks very much. My question is uh, fitting. It's about getting our finances back on track and also getting the questioning of this meeting back on track, hopefully as well. So it was on the um, main report. Are you happy for me to pick up my question? Yes, please. Which one was it? It was about um, the the reds and the consultations and a balanced budget. Yes, please do. Right. OK. Um, so the cabinet member for finance said in his summary earlier as well. So this year we've been overspent in an overspent position and we need to get our finances back on track. And this budget, if balanced, proposes to do that. However, there are so many reds that are saying that certain areas are going to be unachievable. And there are also many that require consultation. So obviously, if something needs a public consultation, we, we're not sure if that is actually going to be progressed with until we've got the public's feedback on that. I think we had one from this year, from this year's budget, where we haven't gone out to consultation yet for this year, and that's been pushed back. So I wondered how confident are we in achieving a balanced budget and sticking to this next year so that we're not overspending again? And I've used an example and I will explore this more in the education scrutiny um, tomorrow. But for example, when we're talking about all of this, this is all figures on a sheet of paper. So if we make a, a cut to education to schools budget of 5%, we will see more in a deficit position. So we're not actually making any savings there, just on paper, the deficit is moving to a different piece of the paper. So I wondered how we're going to achieve this as a balanced budget next year, please. 
Thank you very much, Councillor Williams. Uh, Karis, would you like to take that? Yeah, th thank you very much for your question, Councillor Williams. I think um, we would all agree that there's more, more risk in this draft budget than we've probably carried in any budgets previously. Um, and that's not just the case for Bridgen, that would be the case for every local authority um, in, well, wider than Wales, everywhere going forward into next year. We have limited resources and we're trying to use them to, um, to meet the key priorities of the council. Now, we are trying to mitigate some of that risk next year because some of the pressures that are in there for approval are recognising that there are overspends in the current financial year which are not going to be able to pull back to the level that they need to be. So we are mitigating some of that. We have also, and it was raised at Cabinet mm -hmm. yesterday, had a discussion about how we monitor the, the budget once it's approved and once it goes forward. Um, and I think uh, um, we will be reviewing our monitoring process to make sure that we pick up variances very quickly and that we bring um, reports through and that we all work together to try and mitigate that. Now, whether that's about changing the service or whether that's about reducing the, the volume of the service that we can provide, but that we will certainly be a lot more rigorous next year in our financial monitoring um, throughout the year from day one. Thank you very much, Karis. Councillor Williams, you content? Yes, sorry, I've put my hand up for my next question on this Kevin report after Councillor Griffiths. Thanks. Thank you very much. Councillor Grivis. Thank you, Chair. Um, my questions were um, around the level of risk to be carrying. Um, this is principally page, um, page 36. Um, um, my concern here is that we have produced a series of cost cuts which add up to the total that we need. However, we recognise within that envelope of cost savings that um, 47 percent of them are, or 40 percent of the value is of significant risk of not being delivered. So that that means we have a very substantial risk that we will not be able to deliver the cost savings and therefore we will overrun our budget. Um, so my, my own view on this is that that ha having th this high level of um, of very risky savings, in other words, savings that will not be realised, is is not uh, or presents the council with too high a level of risk in the longer term, and I would suggest that we uh, we need to overestimate because uh, overestimate and therefore identify additional cost savings. And I know this is incredibly hard for us to do, but I think we have to do it because we have to recognise that some of those reds will definitely not be delivered as cost savings. So we need other alternatives as well. In essence, what I'm saying is. We have to um, include savings, maybe 50% extra, assuming that 50% of them will actually fail to be delivered. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Karis? Yeah, uh, thank you for that question. And I apologise, Councillor Williams, I didn't answer your second question, which was around the amount of consultation that's needed in that budget. We can't preempt the decision that will be made by Council um, at the end of February. However, services will be looking to make sure that if any consultation is needed in order to bring about these changes, that they will be ready to roll as soon as we have a decision on that budget. So that work is going on now to get things in train to, to um, be able to make the changes that are needed as soon as we possibly can. Um, and that refers to all of the savings right across that budget that you've got in front of you this afternoon. So I, I suppose as well, Councillor Griffiths, that's one way of us trying to mitigate some of the risk that we have um, in that budget. Um, I, I understand your request about overestimating. In other words, I, I think you're saying um, identify further savings um, so that w if we get them all in train, we will meet the overall budget. Um, I think in previous years that might have been possible. I think that's quite a difficult, well, a very difficult ask for the coming financial year. You'll see from the detail that you've got in your paperwork this morning, all services have been reviewed. Everybody's been asked to look for everything. I think finding additional savings at this point is difficult. You'll, you'll see um, in the appendix that there is about half a million pounds that's not allocated within um, some of the funding that we've got. Um, so there is a buffer there, but I do appreciate that's not a lot of money left to allocate based on uh, the, the budget that we're looking at. 
but also I did mention uh, when I presented the report to you this morning that there is some money currently over and above that currently unallocated within the central budgets. Um, and that's the additional million pound we've had in relation to the council tax and also the teacher's pension, depending on what the outcome of that is. Now, it may well be that you would want to suggest that some of that money, when we come to final budget stage, is not allocated, but is left as a central contingency so that we have some um, capacity to meet if any of those savings do not come in as soon as we would have hoped. I hope that answers your question, Councillor Griffiths. Thank you, Karis. Councillor Griffiths? Yeah, I'm, I'm still extremely uncomfortable because if something is looking red on here, I think some of them will fail, which means we will overspend. Um, I, I think that's that's not an option for us. We we do not have an option for overspend in future years. Um, so, and I I understand what Kaiser said, but that it's extremely hard. I understand that we may have mitigating monitoring um, processes to make sure that we deliver. But if something is red, it means there is a significant risk that it won't be delivered, um, and therefore we have to fully mitigate that risk in some way. And I and I don't believe we sufficiently mitigate in that risk. Uh, and I think we need to look at other ways of doing that. This that may impact the capital um, the capital plan. Obviously, that's coming up in February for us to look at in more detail. But I think we have to find um, um, a, a plan B, if you like, for let's let's say that, that you know a quarter of the reds don't don't deliver savings. Well, where is that money going to come from? It's going to have to come from somewhere, and it's going to have to come from in year in year savings. Because that's our only option if we actually don't deliver against those savings. So um, I, I would urge um, cabinet and the officers to look at at further mitigation by identifying uh, other options, and that might be, for example, delaying capital spend and, and other things. But at the moment, to me, this this budget is not a budget that we can achieve because we are including reds um, in, in in our base level um, cost cutting. Thanks, Councillor Griffiths. I just want to add a supplementary remark to that. Obviously, uh, Karis, you have a duty, don't you, as um, Section 151 officer to set a balanced and robust budget. But given the fact that um, what Councillor Griffiths is saying is that, you know, we know from personal experience in this financial year that we've had to make some uh, in-year revisions and environments to support uh, the Social Services Directorate. So how can you um, satisfy uh, members that you are actually uh, content as the Section 151 officer, that we are set in that balanced and robust budget without the requirements to make those in-year savings. Um, and also, given this context, is it wise, given the environments uh, during this financial year, uh, for the principle of all directorates having to make a contribution uh, to the overall savings required? Surely this will put um, the Social Services Director, which Council of Bledsoe's Committee will look at in more detail uh, on Friday, wouldn't, surely this will put it uh, in an unsustainable situation and pressure, uh, given the increase in contacts in social care uh, and an increase in the complexity of issues which are uh, listed as a budget pressure in this area. So um, can you perhaps give some more indication of how you, have co how you will come to a conclusion about whether this budget is balanced and robust? And before you answer that question, I know Councillor Williams has a supplementary question on this risk factor as well. So perhaps I can bring her in on that. Councillor Williams, Amanda. Apologies, I asked mine beforehand. It was on. It was with regards to the um, the, the the reds and them being unachievable, um, and how we ensure it's balanced. So that has that's, been asked. I put my hand up now because I had another question on the council tax. Um, sure, uh, we'll bring uh, you and uh, Councillor Bennett. I know wants to ask, ask a question on council tax as well. But Karis, perhaps you can ask, answer my question then on. Um, how you can come to a conclusion on a uh, balanced and robust budget, given the number of uh, risks which Councillor Griffiths has highlighted. I think, I, th I think I've already said, I said it at Cabinet yesterday and I've already said it this morning, there is a lot of risk in that budget um, and I fully acknowledge that. But the proposals that you've got in front of you are the are the are really, many of them are the only options that we've got moving forward at this current time. Now, some of those things are red um, because they need some consultation. And as I said, we will kick off the consultation uh, once we know what that final budget approval is. Some of them are issues because we have uh, we will need to make changes to the structures, our staffing structures. That will take time. 
but again work is going on now so that if that budget is approved we can hit the ground running in march to get some of those things up and running so i think there is there is risk in there um but we are trying to do everything we can to mitigate that before we get into the financial year i think the other question that was asked about how we would pick up on this i've talked about the monitoring and and i think a, a question was raised around social care but we would have to have very early discussions about how those services are being delivered and whether or not there is another way in which that service that can be delivered that actually brings that service down, uh, brings that spend down, or actually talking about the service as it is. Um, and we will put um, early monitoring processes in place so that we pick up on those early and that actually we have those challenging discussions as I would say, all of us as a one council with regards to how we are going to address that budget issue as early as we possibly can. Thanks very much, Karis. Uh, Councillor Griffiths, would you like to come back to all on that? Your microphone is switched off. Thank you, Chair. Um, yeah, I think Karis's words are somewhat reassuring, reassuring there. I, th I think some of the reds there are, are because we haven't done a consultation and so on. I think they're more amber than red, to be honest. Um, I, I wonder whether we should look again at that red classification to see that the things that are just delayed because of consultations move them into amber because we're reasonably certain they can be delivered um, and, and really use the red to highlight ones which are truly high risk in, it, in, it, in that there may be a 50, more than 50% chance that they won't be um, won't be realised. So I, I think maybe the Maybe from what I've heard now, the reds are not true reds in, in, in the normal definition of that. And maybe we could reallocate them a little bit so that where we are reasonably certain that they will be uh, delivered, we actually make them number. Thank you, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, Karen, please. Thank you. Those are really helpful comments. I think that's something that we can do now between now and the final budget coming out in, um, in uh, towards the end of February. And we'll, we'll certainly look at that now in the next month. Thank you, Karis. Thank you, Chair. Thanks very much, Karis. Thank you, uh, Councillor Griffiths. Uh, Councillor Williams, then, please. Thank you very much, Chair. Mine was on the council tax element, and it says in the report that the recovery rates have dropped um, because more households are struggling to pay. So I wondered if we could have some more information on how much it's dropped and um, if, we, if we're concerned that if, if council tax is raised by nine and a half percent for next year, will we have a further increase in households being unable to pay this? And it links in, which I'll raise after, to CEX 28, if we're going to cut potentially people in our council tax department and yet we're having an increase in people unable to pay, how will we be able to deal with that then with less staff on the ground? Thanks. Thanks very much, Councillor Williams. Karis? Yes, thank, thank you for that um, question, Councillor Williams. Obviously, our council tax collection is crucial um, at the end of the day to how we um, actually fund the spend that's going through the council. Um, our collection rates did drop uh, during the pandemic uh, for obvious reasons. They are starting to come back up again. Uh, just to confirm, really, our collection rates at the end of December were down slightly on, on this time last year at just about 83%. Um, so they are coming up from where they were when we um, when we were going through the pandemic. We are still trying to chase arrears, and we will continue to do that. Um, the The issue that you've raised around, I mean, obviously the um, so we will continue to do that. The issues we have is this is quite volatile. People don't realise sometimes, I think. But for instance, we have a number of people who have cancelled their direct debits during December in the run up to Christmas. And I fully understand in the current climate why people will do that. But then they will restart them again in the new year. And we will start to see some of that money coming through now in the last three months of the year. And we monitor that very closely. Uh, with regards to the impact of a 9.5% council tax, we do, um, if that were to go ahead, then we do work closely with people who are starting to struggle in paying their council tax. So we do work with them about repayment plans. We do give them advice. We'll signpost them if we can. The other thing that we do have, of course, is the council tax relief scheme, which is coming to council later on today. Um, and we certainly signpost people into that relief scheme um, as soon as we know that there are problems there and they may be eligible for that support. 
So we do try and work with people to um, avoid them getting into arrears or to support them where they are in difficulty. And I know you said you were going to raise it uh, uh, around some of the detail in the savings, but we are doing some work in council tax around automating some of the work that we have. And that's about um, using the systems, the IT systems that we've got um, as much as we can to, to help us in our administration of the, of the council tax function. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Karis. Uh, Councillor Williams, are you content with that? Yes, thanks. Thank you. Councillor Bennett, you've disappeared. Are you, would you like to raise? Yes, Chair, I did ask to be called in. I did ask to be called in, but obviously that was the same question that I had. I suppose, um, I suppose as a supplement to that, in the budget somewhere else, it mentions a cut to the CAB, who also provide benefits, advice and income maximisation um, services. So just, um, I guess, have we taken into consideration the risk in the round, you know, the collective impact of some of these decisions um, and how it's going to impact on already struggling residents? So, yeah, it's, it's kind of, is, is the level of risk and the um, cost built into the contingent that was referenced earlier. I suppose I'll ask that question instead. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Bennett. Karis? Yeah, th thank you for that question. We are aware that we have tried to look across all of those savings that you've got in front of you, regardless of which service they're sitting in, to try and make sure that there are no um, duplications, if you like. We uh, we are aware that um, there are there are cuts proposed in other areas in, uh, for the third sector, and we're aware of the impact that they will have. Um, but we're, we are trying to ch um, uh, balance this budget. And as far as the council tax and benefits is concerned, we will still have staff here, obviously, who can give people advice um, and who can support them should they be getting into any difficulties. Thanks, Caris. Councillor Bennett, you can stand with that. I accept the response. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, just on council tax, as we're on it, obviously this is the elephant in the room, and uh, it's uh, an inflation in, inflation busting council tax increase of 9.5%. Can I ask how this uh, increase compares to other local authorities in Wales, please, Karis? I think has already been alluded to um, previously this morning. Um, all. Uh, authorities are looking at significant savings and all authorities are having to look very closely at how they're going to fund that. Um, many authorities are in the same position as we are with regards to the timeline and by that I mean that their draft budgets are now coming out into the into the public for consultation and there is a range across Wales and at the moment um, I would say Bridgend is um, certainly in the pack, it's certainly not the highest um, there will be some that will be lower, but it's certainly not the highest proposal. Uh, the other thing I would just caveat that with is there can be change between the draft budget and the final budgets as people go through, as we are in consulting chair, and, and things may change. But at the moment, we're certainly not the highest in Wales. Thanks for that, Karis. And perhaps I can ask um, before uh, he has to leave us, uh, Councillor Williams and, of course, Councillor David, as well as the leader, um, if the finance if the final budget settlement does change, where is Cabinet's view? Is it to protect frontline public services uh, and minimise the cut to them, or is it to decrease council tax, or is it a mix of both? Where are your priorities as a Cabinet? I'm happy to... Councillor Williams? No, Give way to the Leader. Oh, well, I, I think this is where it's important to, to, to listen. So actually, there was value in Brett because what, what we did have from Brett was I think there was concern about both um, in terms of what, what, what do we do? Um, and uh, we, we'd be minded to look at both if there was any flexibility. But then we do go back to the other risks that have been identified by colleagues. This is going to be an incredibly tough budget to deliver and therefore we also need to maintain some flexibility in the budget to ensure that it is um, it is deliverable in the sense that the the, 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 the savings are are realized uh, and and we have a, a budget that balances uh, uh, next year 
we're, we're very mindful of the impact on council taxpayers and we're very mindful of the impact on, on, on services as well. And, and as I said, I hear that, we hear that loud and clear from uh, BREP. I don't think there was a, a consensus from BREP. Um, I, I think it was probably a combination of both from BREP, wasn't there? Uh, and that's probably where we are at the moment. The difficulty, though, is that we haven't got the headroom that we had in previous years, where we were able to balance uh, that, that and have uh, much lower council tax increases. Uh, you know, in some in some years, we've got them lower than the rate of inflation. Uh, but but that isn't going to be possible uh, this year. And I think we need to be realistic that that council tax figure is is not going to change uh, fundamentally. I don't think that is going to be possible uh, because of the scale of the, the the challenge we face. And likewise, being frank and honest, I don't think uh, we're able to. Uh, to, to, to mitigate the service uh, reductions again in the way that we were able to in, in, in previous years because of the scale of the, um, uh, of, of, of the pressures that we, we, we face this year. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for that, uh, Councillor David. Councillor Williams, would you like to add anything? Just uh, very, very briefly to add to that, um, I suppose I, I have uh, I, I said earlier that my priority is education. And, uh, and providing children with the best start. So, but you know that that is my voice amongst many in the council chamber. And what we'll come to is a balance, I'm sure, between service provision and council tax uh, uh, impact on on the, on the public. I think we are mindful that there is a cost of living crisis. Uh, we've got a, a council tax reduction uh, report going. Um, I believe it's this afternoon, isn't it, to yeah. to to full council. And that will provide very much needed support for uh, the, the, you know, the, the um, for, for members of the of the public that, that need it. Um, but uh, we, we're also acutely aware that uh, you know we, we need to look at the the squeezed middle of the of the call, isn't it? No, it's a very important cohort, and uh, and what we don't want is for uh, to, to add unnecessary pressure to those. Also, we've got to bear in mind that you know, we've constantly been told that next year will be worse. And, and we have to balance that. So, uh, And as I said, at the end of the day, it's really important that we set a budget that works. We've, we've spent a lot of time this morning now identifying risks within the budget. We've got to be confident that when we set that budget on the 28th of February, it's a budget that will work, that is balanced and can be delivered. And, uh, and so they, th those are all the things that we've got to assess, and that we'd be taking the, um, uh, the, the, the views from the, from the public now through the um, now through the. Sorry, there's some uh, interference in the chamber. I don't know. Probably uh, a ta mobile telephone, which is interfering with the system. Okay. I, think, I, I think I've made my point, Chair. You know, it, it is about balancing risk. And, and after, and our, after our vociferous debate earlier on, I think we've come to an agreement that we have to try and protect the most vulnerable yes. and in a, in a cost of living crisis. It's going to be a, an incredibly difficult balance to strike protecting public services while ensuring that council tax is as low as possible. And perhaps I can uh, refer to one of the recommendations from BREP, and that was uh, from August, in that we ought to do better in communicating with the public on what they actually get for their council tax, because there's not a realisation, is there, that council tax doesn't fund everything. Um, you know, 27%, I think, is it funded by council tax, and the you know the greatest sum is from uh, our aggregated um, external uh, fund funded grant. It's something like that, isn't it? AEG, AEF, uh, AEF. Uh, so um, we need to communicate that better with the public. Uh, and it's going to be very difficult when they see council tax going up to 9.5% and, of course, uh, re um, services re um, reducing. So it's uh, something for our communications team uh, to use every avenue possible uh, to um, communicate that message to our residents. Uh, OK, um, we we'll go now to Councillor Thomas and Councillor Griffiths, and then, unfortunately, I'm going to have to take a short uh, break uh, to have a breath of fresh air after this very uh, stressful uh, meeting thus far. Uh, otherwise, I might uh, suffer from an, an epileptic seizure. Councillor Thomas. Yeah. 
Thanks, Chair. Um, I did have a, uh, um, a question on a specific budget pressure. I'll leave that till after your break. Um, but if I may, I did have one or two comments on council tax. And to answer your question, Chair, about where we are, if you like, in the league table, if there's a if a recent Wales Online uh, article is to be believed, um, I think Pembrokeshire uh, suggested an absolutely staggering 25%. Um, but we're up there on, on the, the highest quartile of uh, council tax increases. And I, I think you've also got to consider the cumulative impact of previous years, high council tax rises as well, and the, and the, the base level as well. So I'm just wondering, I know it's difficult because there's several unknowns uh, for this budget, let alone next year's budget. But, you know, it, given that the, the Cabinet member sources has already said that next year's budget uh, is going to be equally challenging, if not more so, can our residents expect another double digit council tax rise next year then, therefore? That's my first question. The other question I had, and it relates to uh, Karis's comments from Councillor Williams's question uh, with regards to support for council tax arrears. And that is something that I really welcome because a lot of my constituents are telling me that they are going to really struggle uh, with quite high council tax levels. But that being said, how are we going to differentiate between those that can't pay and those that won't pay? What level of analysis will we do? Will we be looking at things like uh, using the services of credit agencies or anything like that. How, how are we going to evidence this? Um, because otherwise we're going to have incredible levels of non-compliance, I fear. Uh, that's there, the two questions, Chair. I'll, I'll, I'll leave my specific one for till after, you, after the break, if I may. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Karis? Uh, th thank you uh, for your questions, Councillor Thomas. With regards to uh, the year after's council tax, we're currently modelling on a 4.5% increase. Um, but I think, as Councillor Williams or Councillor Howard Williams said earlier, um, at the moment we're being told that we will get um, a cash flat settlement for next year. Uh, as you know, inflation rates gone back up again this morning. So it's very difficult at the moment to predict what that would be. The only thing I would say is I think we will be doing our start in our modelling earlier next year um, to make sure that we're well sighted on the impact of any changes. Um, but I mean, I don't think we're in a position at the moment to tell you what that council tax was likely to be in 25-26. In, in relation to the council tax arrears, we do work very closely with people. Um, and when we're determining if somebody is eligible, for instance, for the council tax relief scheme, we, we, we do have information with regard to the benefits that people will currently have. So we will know they will already have gone through a system whereby their, their um, financial position is assessed and, and decisions have already been made by, for instance, the DWP with regard to benefits that people may have. So we do we do, do checks to make sure that this is not that they, it's, it's not they won't, it's not that they can't pay, they won't pay. And where we know that they won't pay, that is where we obviously uh, push hard for collection of arrears. Thanks, Karis. Councillor Thomas? Yeah, I, I'm just, uh, I'm not really just sure that it's people who may struggle to pay these quite large council tax uh, levels that are solely in receipt of benefits. So how would you analyse the ability for, say, if I said I struggled. How, how would you evidence if, if I came to you and said I can't pay my council tax, I'm not in receipt of benefits apart from child uh, tax credits. Uh, how, would, how would you assess if, I, if I'm able to pay or not, whether, or whether I'm just spinning you a yarn? Thanks, Karis. Uh, very, very much the same as if, they, if somebody approached the DWP about receiving benefits, we would want to see uh, financial information of the outgoings that that individual or that family may have together with the income that they have. And we'd, we would test that as much as we possibly could before we went down the route of giving them support. But once we were happy that they would do that support, we do everything that we could to support them. And sorry, Chair, if I may, that sounds quite uh, a demanding process to do all that financial ana analysis. Do we really have the resources to do that? And how many officers will we have doing that sort of uh, anal financial analysis work? We do it currently now, um, Councillor Thomas, within the uh, within the structure that we have. 
Um, if, the, if we saw a significant increase in the number of people coming in requesting that we were having to underdo those checks, then I'd suggest that's one of those services we'd have to do a deep dive into to make sure that it is able to do what we're asking of it. But at the well, moment, they are able to do that work. Thanks. That's very helpful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Karis. Thank you, Councillor Thomas. Uh, with uh, Councillor Griffiths' permission, uh, I need to take a short break. I'm sorry. I was going to suggest that, Chair. Thank you. No problem. Thank <laughs> you.